Well, thanks, John, and Bill, thank you for your kind words as well, and it's great to be with you today. I've been looking forward to this time. I assume some of you may be wondering why I picked the topic, the virtue of profit. Uh, but in light of what has occurred in our economy over the last two years, uh, we all realize that there are many people who have suffered pain, pain of loss of value and assets, some, some cases their retirement assets, uh, loss of income, and, uh, and some have lost their jobs. And while we know that, we know that about our friends, we know we read about it, some of us have experienced it, at the same time, there are certain firms that uh, are described in the press as financial firms who receive funds from our government that we call bailout funds. And they've earned some extraordinary profits and they've paid some extraordinary bonuses. Uh, there's something about that that uh, doesn't seem fair. I think most of us would agree. In fact, some would argue it's an injustice. So, so how should we think about profit. Is it a virtue or is it a vice? Is it something essential to our way of life or something we put up with as part of the free market system, allowing the self-interest of some to profit and produce so that the needed goods and services are available to the whole? Profit is usually defined in economic terms it is that surplus or positive bottom line that results when revenue exceeds expenses. You know, for the investor and shareholder, however, it only occurs when that bottom line exceeds cost of capital. And so profit is often used as a measure of the effectiveness of the business firm. It is the engine that generates capital. It is the source for the creation of wealth. But its function is not limited to business, although it's almost always described in relationship to business, without charitable contributions, the source of which, by the way, is somebody who earned a profit, uh, and other sources of revenue <coughs> consistently exceeding expenses, the nonprofit will not have the needed capital to do its mission and will soon realize that it is in the process of going financially bankrupt. We're sitting in a building today that was built by profit. The same is true for every family unit in our society. If a family has expenses that continue to exceed income, the day of reckoning is just around the corner. I would suggest that that principle also applies to government. There is an ultimate limit to the amount you can borrow to cover deficits. Witness the present dilemma facing the governments of Japan, Iceland, Ireland, Greece, Spain, Portugal, to just name a few, and what could someday be described possibly with respect to our government. So can we say profit is good? Those who uh, assume a zero-sum world argue that profit benefits only a few at the expense of many. Now, we don't have to accept this argument but we do know that the making of money can become consuming, can be an addiction, where enough is never enough. The Bible reminds us that the love of money is the root of all evil. Jesus asked his followers, what will it profit a man if he gain the whole world but lose his own soul? He instructed his disciples not to lay up their treasures here on earth, but in heaven, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. He went on to say that no one can serve two masters, for you cannot serve God and money. These words of Jesus remind us that profit has an end goal of life and measured only in dollars and cents is an empty vessel and can result in the poverty of the soul. You can't take it with you. At the end of life, how much money, or as Tolstoy put it in his essay, how much land does a man need? His conclusion, just enough for a six-foot grave. So can I ask you the question, is profit a virtue or is it a vice? 
is a business person who seeks to follow God's ways, caught in that dilemma of serving two masters. What is there in common between God and profit? That service master, uh, the business where I worked for 25 years, we attempted to answer some of these questions. As I've now retired and look back at my leadership responsibilities, uh, I can add up those numbers that show growth in profits and customers served and a premium return for our shareholders. And while these figures are part of the normal business assessment of performance, the conclusion for me is that I cannot be limited to just money and value creation measurements of profit. I'm a person of faith. I'm a Christian, a follower of Jesus Christ. My faith, by its very nature, is a defined faith. Definition brings clarity, allows for order in a systematic way for me to think about my faith. It can, however, also set boundary lines, determine limits for what is and what is not. It can be exclusive in shutting out those who do not believe the same way I do or fit my definition. How then do I relate the claims of my faith with the demands of my work in a diverse and pluralistic marketplace? A marketplace focused on making profits and creating wealth. As a leader in business, how do I touch the spiritual side of the people within the firm? Can I live and share my faith in a way that can be examined and tested by my colleagues and fellow workers, and yes, even be embraced by some? Can the concept of profit be measured beyond the bottom line and include the growth and development of the people producing the results of the firm? Can a profitable return from one's leadership in business be measured by the changed lives of people? As a business leader, I wanted to excel at generating a profitable, profitable bottom line and creating value for our shareholders. If I didn't want to play by these rules, I didn't belong in the ball game. But I also tried to encourage an environment where the workplace could be an open community, where the question of a person's moral and spiritual development, the existence of God, and how one related the claims of their faith with the demands of their work were issues of discussion, debate, and yes, even learning and understanding. I considered the people of our firm as the soul of the firm. Our corporate objectives as Service Master were simply stated to honor God in all we do, to help people develop, to pursue excellence, and to grow profitably. Those first two objectives were end goals. The second two were means goals. We did not use that first objective as a basis of exclusion. It was, in fact, the reason why we promoted diversity as we recognized that different people with different beliefs were all part of the world that God so loved and were definitely all part of the marketplace that we served. It did not mean that everything was done right. We experienced our share of mistakes. We sometimes failed and did things wrong. But because of a stated standard and a reason for that standard, typically we could not hide our mistakes. Mistakes were regularly flushed out into the open for correctness, and in some cases, forgiveness. The leaders couldn't hide behind or protect themselves at the expense of the people they were leading. In a diverse and pluralistic society, some may question that first objective, to honor God. And whether it belongs as part of a mission statement or purpose statement of a business, or for that matter, in our case, of a public company. But regardless of your starting point, the principle that could be embraced simply by all is where it led, and that was to honor and recognize the dignity and worth of every person, and our responsibility to be involved in not only what a person was doing, but also who they were becoming in the work environment. Those people who are producing the profits, who are accomplishing the mission of the firm, are human. They have cares and concerns, emotions, feelings, beliefs, and convictions. They have the potential to do good or evil, love or hate, contribute or detract, motivate or discourage. An investment by leadership in the development of people can make a difference. 
It requires, says Peter Drucker, the understanding of the human condition, including the recognition that there is a spiritual dimension to the, our humanity. So it's all about the process of developing not just financial capital, but also human capital. Or as Robert Fogel, an economist from the University of Chicago and a Nobel Prize winner, put in his book, The Fourth Great Awakening, the growing of spiritual assets. There were many examples of profitable returns from investing in people that occurred during my service master career. Let me share just one with you. As part of expanding our business to China, I was asked to give a lecture to a group of business leaders and members of government in the Great Hall of the People using the service master model as my subject. Overall, there was a positive response. As a result, we found a good partner for our business in China. After my talk, one of the Chinese businessmen came up to me and whispered in my ear, and he said, I think this is maybe the first time Jesus Christ has been man mentioned in the Great Hall of the People. Uh, but several weeks after that event, uh, I received a note from one of our Chinese employees who had been traveling with me as an interpreter. Here is what Zhu Zhang said. When I grew up in China, religions were forbidden, and Mao's book became our Bible. When I was five or six years old, I could recite Mao quotations and even use them to judge and lecture the kids in the neighborhood. Mao said, serve the people. Leaders should be public servants. This coincides with some of Service Master's moral standards. When I think deeply, I see the difference that makes one's work so successfully and the other collapse fatally. It must be the starting point of Service Master to honor God and that every individual has been created in his image with dignity and worth. Service Master is designed to be a big, tall tree with strong roots which penetrates extensively to almost every corner of a person's daily life. It is still growing in mine. I am still learning. Sue was a thinking person. She was different. She came from a different culture as she came into our company, but felt accepted and respected in her work environment. She was confronted with the life choices that went beyond doing the job and earning a living. Choices about who she was becoming and how she could relate to God. Investments in people can be risky. Mistakes are often painful. Implicit in leadership is the power to make decisions that affect others. You can be right in your intent and decision, but wrong in how you use power to implement that decision. The mistakes I've made as a leader that hurt the most are those that have resulted in breached relationships with others. In seeking to achieve certain performance goals, I have at times pressed too hard for results without understanding the subjective factors of fear, insecurity, risk of failure that were influencing substandard performance. The pain of honestly facing your mistakes and seeking forgiveness is part of the learning process of investing in others. And yes, sometimes recouping your investment for a greater return. This investment in others has the potential to far exceed what money can buy. And often you have that special joy of seeing your investment in a person multiplied in the lives of others. And yes, there are times when you see a positive response to the redemptive word of our Lord Jesus Christ. Profit measured in the changed lives of people with our lifeblood at Service Master. As I retired from the leadership of the firm, we were involved in managing and employing over 200,000 people, delivering one or more of our services to over 12 million customers in the U.S. and 45 foreign countries. The growth of our business now and the growing investment in people, however, could not have been possible without the profit of a growing positive line. This most traditional way of looking at profit provided the source of our financial capital for growth. 
and for a return to our shareholders. It was for us a measure of effectiveness of our combined efforts. As I said, it was a means goal, but was also a virtue of accountability. Noel Titchy, a professor at the University of Michigan, described Service Master in his book, The Leadership Engine, as follows. And I quote, for many people who don't know the folks at Service Master, the stated value to honor God in all we do is troubling. Before we went to visit them, one of my colleagues suggested that their religious orientation might make them unsuitable models for the more normal organization. But the truth is that when you get to know the people who work at Service Master, you quickly see that there are no traces of the ethereal about them. They are serious business people, firmly focused on winning. Profit to them is a means in God's world to be used and invested, not to an end to be worshipped. It is a standard for determining the effectiveness of their combined efforts. So as we think of this whole subject of profit, let me now return to scripture. Psalm 24 reminds us that God owns everything. He owns our life. He owns our time. He owns our resources. He owns everything that we talk about owning, but we really don't own. We possess it in trust. We're trustees for the benefit of God, of our talents, our resources, our time, our life. That's the principle of Psalm 24. Now you take that principle and compare it with the story of the parable of the talents. You all remember that story. And you remember the person who didn't double it, but buried it. And he was condemned. And what was said when he was condemned? You didn't even put it in the bank for interest. What was that interest? That interest is what we call profit. There was no return. He was just giving back what he had received. As God has entrusted all these things to us, he doesn't want us to give it back. I believe he wants more. He wants us to invest what he's given us so that there is a return, so that there is a profit. I often refer to this as God's economy of surplus. As you invest your life in people, the road may be bumpy. At times, there may seem to be more downside than upside, with little or no measurable results from the investment. God's measurement, however, is with eternity in view. It was C.S. Lewis who said, there are no ordinary people. You've never met a mere mortal. Nations, cultures, arts, civilization, their life is to ours as the life of a gnat. But it is the immortals whom we joke with, work with, marry, snub, and exploit. Every person we work with has their own fingerprint of potential. It's all part of being created in the image and likeness of God. The investment is there for us to make as we integrate the claims of our faith with the demands of our work and understand that there is a virtue in living a profitable life for our Lord and Savior. Thanks for listening.